Okay, we're back. We're live with Wayne Passell. Passelli or Passell? I, I still don't get it right. Passelli. Passelli. All right. right. Okay. Yes. And um, he is uh, an executive with the Animal Wellness Action out of Washington, D.C. And uh, he is here to talk to us about uh, cockfighting arrests on Molokai, uh, I guess in I guess in May, um, which is very interesting. So uh, what is what is animal wellness action? Um, because, you know, we need to be concerned about animal wellness. We need to be concerned about every part of the animal kingdom. But what do you guys do about it? Well, we concentrate on establishing legal protections for animals to forbid a variety of forms of animal cruelty to domesticated animals and also to wild animals. But then I think, Jay, very importantly, we work to enforce our laws. The laws without enforcement are simply slips of paper. And with this asymmetrical relationship we have with humans and animals that we hold all the power, we hold all the cards, we can do whatever we want to these animals, we need restraints put on people and the law serves that function. I'm thinking of the um, Attenborough uh, movies uh, of which there are a number of them on cable these days. Um, for standing for the proposition, which I'm sure you guys live in, um, and that is, you know, it's all integrated. It's all part of the same um, geo environment. And um, we need to protect the animals because they're part of that environment. You know, the Earth spent um, hundreds of thousands of years developing its flora, fauna, animals, humans, what have you. And we can't afford to lose them. And we are losing them by way of extinction and, and uh, one kinds of brutality or another by human beings to animals. This is very tragic because you can't bring it back. Is that, is that part of your mission? Oh, without, without question, Jay, you know, we all breathe the same air. Uh, we drink water, it has to be clean. Uh, we depend on planetary health for survival and animals and humans are no different in that respect. I think in another way, it's important to remember that, you know, animals have a heartbeat just like we do. Uh, they feel pain, they suffer. Uh, they are not just machines that are in some endless quest for mates and gathering food. Uh, they have emotions. They feel terror when threatened. They feel happiness when they play together. They feel love for their family members. It's just a human construct for us to think, oh my God, humans are here and then animals are so different. Uh, any of us who've had a dog or a cat any of us who pay attention to nature and see wild animals knows that this is a continuity of life, that the differences are differences of degree and not kind. And that if we truly are a moral species, if humanity means something and the root word of humanity is humane, we can show compassion and decency to the other creatures who share this planet. We can be the lords and do horrible things, or we can be the lords and do good things. And I choose the latter. Of course. So uh, how did you get into this? Uh, how did you get to be the executive director of Animal Wellness Action? Are you a founder? Uh, what drives you? I am a founder, and I've been involved. I'm 55 years old, but I started an animal welfare group when I was a college student and undergraduate at Yale University. I... It was going to go to law school, but got pulled into doing animal advocacy. I then have run a number of the major national animal welfare groups, have run 40 ballot measures, helped pass 100 federal laws and amendments, uh, nearly 2,000 state laws, negotiated agreements with SeaWorld to stop their breeding of orcas and Walmart to stop the inhumane treatment of animals in their supply chain, and hundreds of other agreements. So it's been a lifelong passion of mine. I wrote a couple of New York Times bestselling books. One of them is called The Bond, Our Kinship with Animals, Our Call to Defend Them. And in that book, I argue that we humans have an instinctive connection to nature and animals. You can see this as a child. We're drawn to animals and we're drawn to them for a variety of reasons, but we actually have within us social bonding hormones that connect us to other people. It's why loneliness is a problem for us. Solitary confinement as a containment strategy in prisons can do a number on us emotionally. We need social interactions in order to be healthy. Animals are part of that. We crave interactions with nature and animals. So that gives us a head start in doing the right thing 
for animals, but it's easy for us to get brainwashed. It's easy for us to uh, dismiss the concerns of animals. And what we try to do at Animal Wellness Action is remind people of the immense threats that exist, whether it's factory farming or horse slaughter or testing on animals that's needless and duplicative or trade in wildlife. And yes, illegal animal fighting, dog fighting and cock fighting, which are horrible forms of human entertainment and gambling where animals suffer and die for no good reason. Mm, yeah, true. So, um, you know, what is, what is the scope of the organization? Are you worldwide? We're worldwide and um, we're pretty new. We're three and a half years old, but we have some of the most veteran people who've ever worked in animal protection. And again, it's all animals. We certainly do a lot in the United States Congress working to advance probably 20 or 30 major new policies. Like we're seeking a ban on mink farming. Mink are killed for their fur. There's been an incredible circumstance where we've learned that mink are the most susceptible mammal to the COVID virus, to SARS-CoV-2. There have been outbreaks of this virus at mink farms throughout the United States and all over the world. This is a threat to keep these animals on factory farm-like conditions. And especially outrageous that we're doing this just to produce mink coats when we don't need them. We have other textiles we can use to adorn us, uh, keep us warm, keep us stylish. Almost all of the pelts that we raised in the United States are being sent to China because there's no domestic market for these pelts. But we work on so many things. We're working to create an animal cruelty crimes unit at the Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Justice. We're working to stop horse slaughter. Uh, we're working to stop needless testing on animals for drug development when there are new alternative innovative methods that can prove the safety and efficacy of drugs. So it's, it's big. We work at the state level and we work internationally. We've got a very important campaign uh, called Kangaroos Are Not Shoes. The largest mammalian slaughter in the world is the shooting of kangaroos by commercial shooters. And the main use of the kangaroos is for their skins or shoes by Nike, Adidas, New Balance to make soccer cleats. Two million kangaroos killed a year, including 400,000 joeys who are the babies who are found in the pouches of their mothers after they're slain. This is outrageous that Fortune 500 companies like Nike and Adidas would be sourcing wild animals from their native habitats through commercial kills, like what we did to the buffalo or the bison in the 19th century in the mid midsection of the North American continent. We massacred bison to produce coats and other products that's what the Australians are doing right now with kangaroos to make shoes. And, you know, companies that all of us have patronized, like Nike and Adidas, are in the thick of this. They're the ones driving the killing, even though they're not pulling the trigger. Are you into um, poaching in Africa? Oh, without question. Um, we're actually helping Asian elephants now because in, in Thailand, there are more working captive elephants there than any other country in the world. And about 3,500 of them are conscripted into taking tourists around with 12 tourists on their back or they do circus type tricks. But when the pandemic hit and Thailand shut down uh, tourism, those elephants haven't, haven't had people to support them. They're starving. So we are, we are supporting Thailand-based groups to feed elephants and we're feeding about 1,200 elephants right now but in Africa, it's a different set of threats. It's more poaching, as you know. Uh, there's also legal uh, killing through trophy hunting where Americans go over there and shoot elephants for their tusks. We tell you know, native Africans, black Africans, don't kill the elephants for their ivory, which is what we should be doing. But then we're allowing these United States rich hunters to go over there and shoot uh, elephants so they can bring back the tusks. I find that terribly inconsistent. I think it is an attack on nature that these people uh, shoot the largest land mammals in the world just for you know, their egos and to mount these tusks in their, in their homes. Uh, so yes, we challenge uh, so many forms of institutionalized cruelty where the state, in the sense the government or major corporations are causing harm to animals. And again, they can't speak up for themselves. We have to be their proxies. And that's what we do through the courts uh, through the lawmaking bodies, through the court of public opinion, uh, by publishing uh, science-based reports, 
by publishing investigations. We did a major investigation that we released um, uh, in September about cockfighting in Hawaii and how the cockfighting community is enormous in Hawaii. And um, it is a spoke and hub relationship throughout the Pacific Rim that, that birds are shipped to Hawaii from Asian countries and shipped from the mainland US to Hawaii, then to go to these Asian countries. And uh, there is significant illegal cockfighting activities uh, on the islands in Hawaii as well. Is it illegal to ship um, a, a bird from to or from Hawaii? Can't, no. It's easy to find it. It's easy to determine that somebody is trying to do that. So the uh, question is, uh, is there anybody trying to stop them from shipping? Well, Jay, it's a very insightful comment. I had worked to make it a federal felony, not just to fight animals in the United States. It's a federal law, but also to possess animals for fighting, to transport them, to use the U.S. Postal Service. What these guys do in Oklahoma and Alabama and California and other states is they, they pack birds in boxes, these fighting roosters. They're very strong, tough animals, and they send them uh, to the Philippines or to Guam or to Vietnam, with Hawaii being the stopover point. It's also the destination for a fair number of birds as well. But this is illegal. But the United States is not doing enough to stop it. We provided incontrovertible evidence. A lot of these people are so arrogant that they openly discuss on Facebook and other social media platforms their sale of fighting animals, their participation in fighting derbies. There's a big a derby, the biggest one in the world, called the World Slasher Cup in the Philippines. And cockfighters from throughout the United States go to the World Slasher Cup. These guys talk about it. If you're a good cockfighter in their parlance, then you win at derbies. And if you win, the offspring of those winning animals go for sometimes thousands of dollars. It's just like horse racing. If your horses win on the track, then you can sell the offspring to other people interested in competition. That's what happens with cockfighting. So if you're a breeder, you have to be fighting because that's the only way you're going to make money. And there is global trafficking in fighting birds. The United States is without question the cockfighting breeding hub of the world. Many, most of the major successful cockfighters in the world are here. And we are shipping birds from the mainland US to Mexico, to the Philippines, those are the two biggest foreign destinations, but they're going to 30 or 40 other countries, probably more. But Hawaii is really at the center. We got uh, shipping records from the Guam Department of Agriculture uh, about 18 months ago. And we then uh, looked at them. There were about 9,000 birds shipped to Guam. Now, Guam is a small US territory, about 170,000 people um, in the Western Pacific. So this, is, this should not be a, a huge hub. The 9,000 birds were shipped just to Guam. Uh, it's probably, you know, I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of birds are being shipped from the mainland to uh, the Pacific Rim every year. So this is just a small indicator. The number one shipping state by number of cockfighters was Hawaii, uh, with Oklahoma second uh, and uh, Alabama third. Oklahoma had the largest volume of birds, so the cockfighters there were shipped a greater number, but no state had more individuals shipping birds to Guam. All of it's a felony. Um, Guam knows exactly what's going on, uh, but the governor is a pro-cockfighting governor, and uh, other politicians are, are, are basically defending cockfighting. Uh, we work to pass a new law in Congress to forbid any shipment of fighting animals to the US territories in 2018. It took effect in December of 2019, so about a year and a half ago. And we've been investigating this trade and found that Hawaii, uh, Hawaii was again you know, central to it. The United States needs to do more to enforce our laws. US attorneys, um, federal law enforcement, whether it's the FBI or the USDA's Office of Inspector General, or the US Postal Inspection Service, these birds are being openly shipped. We know what is going on. This is what was so distinctive about Guam. Guam has no poultry industry. They have no egg laying hen operations. They have no poultry operations, which are the meat birds. They have no show fowl industry. The only reason that you'd be selling 9,000 roosters 
the Guam is for fighting. And I personally went to a conch fight at the major venue on Guam. It's called the Dome. I was, I was there. At. I was there when way back in the time wow. I was in the service. Wow. And I was a concrete uh, um, sort of a coliseum affair. There were a lot of bleachers and concrete benches and the like, right? And, in, and, and a lot of people, hundreds, thousands could sit in this place. And down at the bottom of it uh, was the cockfighting ring. And they were calling out bets. I don't know if it still happens this way. They were calling out bets and waving money in the air <clears throat> based on, you know, what they thought would happen in the fight. And yep. it was brutal. It was brutal. But people loved it. They were so involved in it. It was like a national sport in Guam. And I said to myself, I didn't stay very long. I really couldn't tolerate it. But I said to myself, what is going on here? This is, this is really not Guam. And yet it is Guam. Um, is that still happening? Well, uh, it's amazing, Jay, you went because I, I went to one of the last supposedly legal cockfights. It really wasn't legal, but they, the, the new federal law that really clamped down on it, that cut off any pretense for it, was, was enacted, um, as I said, at the end of 2019. I went in September, the end of September 2019. And yes, uh, the bleachers were, were full. Um, the folks were huddled around this, this little pit, they call it, that plexiglass around it. There's a dirt floor, and they've got a board in the back where they list the birds and the fight schedule. And I think this was a, a two-cock derby where people enter two birds um, into the fight, and they gamble on the outcome, and then people win a bunch of money if they happen to be the winningest fighter that night. And yes, they were screaming and hollering, and people were enjoying uh, this blood sport between animals. I mean, think of all of the forms of entertainment that exist in our world, whether it's live entertainment or it's digital entertainment or it's audio entertainment. Yet these people find the need to engage in animal fighting when it's a felony offense. So the dome closed, uh, but I've just gotten reports recently that they are back at it and Guamanian authorities are not doing anything about it. The United States needs to do something about it. Uh, we have the United States uh, Attorney's Office in Guam and the Northern Marianas Islands, uh, based, in, based in Guam that covers the Northern Marianas. And you know, the United States has law enforcement officials who are in Hawaii. They need to take that, that uh, eight hour flight to Guam and, uh, and stop this open defiance of the United so why, States. Why do people law. do this? Is it cultural? I mean, and I would I would imagine some cultures uh, like it more than others, um, and um, there must be something in the culture or something in in I don't know Schadenfreude comes to mind, you know, of sort of enjoying the the uh, the demise and the, the pain and the and the atrocity. Um, well, so, uh, I'm yeah. wondering if if you've ever looked into why people go to a fight like that. I, I have looked into it and I've thought about it a lot. There's no single answer because everyone is different. But I think that we humans, um, you know, have conflicting impulses and instincts. And I mentioned I wrote a book called The Bond, where I argued that we have natural instincts to be fascinated with animals. And that fascination can, can lead to compassion or that fascination can lead to abuse. I mean, the people who are interested in cockfighting are really interested in the birds. Uh, they love the look of the birds. They love the toughness of the birds. They call it gameness, the characteristic of the birds. It causes them to fight even when they're injured. Uh, so these people are really dazzled by the birds, but they have no compassion for them. I mean, they're fine to see them get hacked up. Uh, animals that they raise, you know, for months or, or years. We should explain um, that, that um, on, on, the, uh, on the leg, or maybe, maybe it's both legs, I don't remember, of, of the given fighting cock. There's a, they attach a, uh, a knife, yes. a very sharp, razor sharp knife that sticks out uh, 90 degrees from the leg of the bird. And the bird, if the bird brings his leg up like that, he can slash the other bird. And yes. they, they, eviscer they eviscerate themselves that way. They do, Jay, you're, you're correct. So the type of fight is defined by the type of weapon. So it might be a short knife fight where the, the knife is about an inch and a half. Or it might be a long knife fight where the uh, knife might be two and a half or three inches. Or it could be a gaff fight. A gaff fight is, a, is like a curved ice pick. 
So they shave down the natural spur on the rooster's leg, and then they strap the knife or the gaff with a leather strap onto the bird's legs, and they weigh the bird. So they're supposed to weigh the same. They've got the same weapons on, and that's supposed to you know, be the fairness of the fight. The handlers have them, and they, they put the birds beak to beak multiple times to incite them and to enrage them because these are territorial animals. Um, you know, one male rooster guards a bunch of hens. So their instinct is to be aggressive toward other uh, roosters. They stoke that and then they put them down and they fight. And usually the fights don't last very long because the weapons are so lethal. So they could gouge We're talking about out. a minute or two, right? It's not very long. Yeah, some of them that go long, they, they pull them out of the main pit and they have side pits, which they call drag pits, and they finish the fight there. But most of the fights that I saw were just, you know, one to three minutes. And, uh, you know, they- And it sustained. results in one, in one of the fighting cocks dying. They, yeah. they die, they fight to the death, yeah. They fight to the death, they get stabbed, they, you know, get lung wounds, they get other heart, heart wounds. You know, one thing that often happens at these fights is that if fluid builds up after they sustain an internal injury, the cockpitter will put his mouth over the bird's mouth and try to suck the fluids that are, that are in the passageway and all the way down in the lungs to try to revive the bird for a short time so he can continue to fight. Think about risky practices. You know, we've just gone through a terrible uh, global uh, pandemic, and that pandemic probably related to a live wildlife market, another form of mistreatment of animals where animals are taken from the wild and, and brought to live wildlife markets so people can buy them and where they're often butchered right in front of the people and they eat these wild animals or they're taken from the wild and they're put in cages and then bred and then brought to the live wildlife market. That is a dangerous circumstance for zoonotic diseases because 75% of, of all emerging diseases come from animals and they jump the species barrier so here you have a behavior where birds who basically have influenza, and that influenza is the type of influenza that afflicts us when we get the flu, they could be hatching a new form of avian influenza that can jump the species barrier. And here you have a perfect set of interactions to transmit. Oh, this. you're right. We, we, are, we are making a movie about this very same spillover effect and the relationship um, with uh, climate change and COVID. But let me let me go let me go to the next uh, point, which we really should cover, and that is Molokai, uh, which I guess falls in the county of Maui. Um, and uh, you made a report, and ultimately the the uh, the authorities um, arrested some some people who were involved in cockfighting there. And and I guess we're going to see now what happens in terms of the prosecution. Can you talk about that so people know? Well, unfortunately, Hawaii is one of just eight states that has misdemeanor penalties under state law. 42 states make cockfighting a felony, but Hawaii has not. And that's because of the power and, and influence of the cockfighting community. I mean, it's hard to believe that you could even talk about the influence of the cockfighting community. But for years, there have been, been efforts in the legislature in Honolulu to try to make it a felony, and it's been thwarted. Because these people say, oh, we're just, you know, this is a cultural tradition. This is what we do. But as I said, it's a federal felony to fight animals, possess them, ship them, trade in the fighting implements. So my hat is off to the local authorities who are enforcing the law. Uh, it's the tip of the iceberg in Hawaii. You go around and you see these little A-frame huts or barrels with roosters tethered to them. If you drive around the Big Island or you drive around the other islands, you see these birds. Those are cockfighting birds. There's no other logical explanation for it. As I said, it's a hub, and you know, it's. I, I knew I knew a fellow on the Big Island um, who had his backyard, which was substantial. Um, he had cages where he he raised them and bred them, hundreds of them. Um, and, that's the way it works. Yep. That, that, yeah. I mean, he was one of a number of people in the network that did that. It was a side, a side job for him. Yeah. No, there are hundreds and hundreds of people in Hawaii doing it, perhaps thousands. Honestly, I, I, it sounds like an exaggeration to say thousands. It's not. When there was an outbreak of virulent Newcastle disease 20 years ago in Los Angeles County, Southern California, it's a big county. 
a lot of people, a lot of land area, authorities went door to door because they were trying to contain this avian influenza um, that could affect commercial poultry operations, pet owners, et cetera. They went door to door, and after they were done, the California Department of Food and Ag and USDA, the U.S. Department of Ag, said there were 10,000 backyard cockfighting operations in Los Angeles County alone. Hawaii is one of the hubs in the United States. So this recent raid in Molokai is very important. It really needs to be just one in a series. And these people will get the message if law enforcement cracks down, you know, and especially if the feds crack down because it's a federal felony. But well, the you, legislature- you think that's going to happen? So this was this was a in, in Molokai. This was part of Maui, and it was, uh, I guess, uh, the prosecutor had to be involved. Um, and yes. there was uh, there were arrests, and uh, maybe maybe the first time uh, or the first time in a long time that that happened. Uh, and I think it's it's, it's in, in part due to the the report that you wrote about the the existence of cockfighting in Hawaii. Um, and what, you know what strikes me is um, you know will there be more, and um, will the feds look at the state action here and take their own action? Because it sounds I, like they could, you know. I think with animal wellness action on the case, certainly yes. We are not going to let the United States, uh, you know, just be inattentive to this issue. This is a form of animal cruelty. It's a threat. To, to our global health because of the global movement of these fighting birds and the potential rise of, an, of a new emerging avian influenza. Uh, it is often associated with other criminal activity, not just gambling, but it's very often bound up with narcotics traffic, human on human violence. I mean, people who are watching and enjoying these fights, are, are they just gonna be a good neighbor to you in general? I doubt it. Um, and I, I think that we have good reasons when we stop animal cruelty, we make our community safer. The people who are involved in dog fighting are often very violent individuals. We need to stop these for the benefit of the animals, but also for the benefit of our communities. Well, I think it's a secondary effect of gambling. Can you talk about that? Well, gambling, you know, is is a widespread activity, but it leaves, you know, a wake of people who lose their assets, who disrupt their 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 families. You know, I had a family member who was a compulsive gambler, uh, and it was horrible for the family. And I, I see it time and time again. And then, of course, if you have gambling debts and you're involved with, you could get involved with organized crime. I mean, it really can spiral from there. So, yeah. you know, our organization is not per se an anti-gambling group, but I've seen it, and I think that again, this is not a form of legalized gambling. We have legalized gambling with you know, casinos and with lotteries and even with horse racing. We, we not, don't have that in Hawaii. It's, it's no. odd. It's ironic, you know, that uh, cockfighting exists. Gambling is a, a big motivator for people to participate. At the same time, gambling here is illegal, flat out. Yes, right. That's right. And, and you do not have a cockfight without gambling. It is, it is bound up with it as much as you have the knives and the gaps on the birds. No one would be interested if the birds didn't have knives and gaps on their legs. No one is interested in cockfighting if you're not gambling. So what about these arrests? Where, where do they go from here? You know, this is a, I mean, you're talking about sending a message, but the message um, needs to have a, a conclusion. It needs it to does. have a, a conviction and a punishment, assuming that, um, you know, these allegations are true, which I imagine they are. Um, what, what happens now? And what will you, Animal Wellness Action, do to follow that story? Well, we will, we will be communicating uh, with the district attorney, taking the case and offer expert uh, witness um, backup because we have experienced people, one of the most experienced people in the United States, the most experienced person in the United States in looking at animal uh, fighting crimes. So we can say, hey, these are all the telltale markers of this, don't be hoodwinked. By this notion that oh I just have these birds because I'm doing show you know I'm showing the birds in derbies and meats it's just not true so we will write to the district attorney and offer support again we're going to urge the legislature as we did in September when we released our report to adopt felony level penalties that's a real deterrent people who lose their freedom by engaging in cockfights are stupid 
uh, there is just no reason to threaten your freedom for this frivolous form of entertainment where animals are killing each other in front of you. It makes no sense for any civilized person. Well, you know, I'd like to follow the story with you, Wayne. Uh, uh, in this, these, these prosecutions um, and any other prosecutions, your efforts in the Hawaii legislature to make it a felony offense. Um, and for that matter, you know, the state of affairs in terms of animal cruelty, cockfighting uh, in Hawaii. I think it came off the uh, plantations for a lot of people. It was a mm -hmm. popular way to spend your time, talk about entertainment, but there's no reason for it now. Um, and uh, if, if there was a time when you could accept it, that, that time is long past. It cannot be accepted. And I admire your organization, your work. And I hope we can you know, circle back uh, with further developments uh, nationally and that affect Hawaii. Well, I thank you for that really clear uh, statement and recitation of the problems with it. And I really believe that the vast majority of people know that it's wrong. Uh, but without awareness, without action, these people will persist. Yeah, it's an interesting name you've got for the organization because it includes the word action. And it means we're not kidding around. Here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wayne, Wayne Paselli, Animal Wellness Action Executive Director. Thank you so much for joining us, Wayne. Jay, what a pleasure. Thank you. Aloha.